I don't know if you've ever been to a funeral or a visitation, wake, whatever you want to call it, for someone who's passed and uh, had somebody say something that's just really awkward. Happens. Example of that is this frequently happens when you're going through a tough spot and then there's somebody who comes up and says, I'll call you, check in on you, and we can get together. And then they never call. Frequently it's because they don't know what to say or what to do. It's just awkward for them. This is one that's pretty pitiful. If my child died, I would be happy because I would know he's in heaven. This one literally happened, says, weeks after my mom died. Well, you know your father will marry again. This is another one. God never gives you more than you can handle. <laughs> or how about, God must really love you to have selected you for this burden. I mean, these really happen. I've been a pastor a long time. Unfortunately, I've heard some of these. Here's one. God, and they always do King James, God is refining you. There must be some sin He is rooting out of your life. And then this one is probably the most pathetic. I know what you're experiencing. My dog died last month. Now, part of the problem is a lot of those statements have some element of truth in them. The problem is it's distorted truth. It's truth that is not life-giving by any means, and it's certainly not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It's just this strange mixture and uh, it just isn't really what you needed. When what you needed more than anything was somebody to just be there and care, be present, maybe take care of some things that need to be done. Instead of telling you something that they thought would be okay to say, because truth is important, but truth that is distorted can be very, very damaging. We're in this series on split the difference, and any time we split the difference between the conditions of God's promises that are in a verse we read, we miss His very best. And, and today, we're talking about this subject of be free. And, and how do you live in the freedom that God has called you to as a believer? And yet, how do you also use this importance of building a solid walk with God so that you don't compromise the potential of all He has for us? John 8, 32, I'm reading it from the Passion Translation. For you, if you embrace the truth... It will release true freedom into your life. The old King James Version of this, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. For many years, I've misquoted that. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you mad. And the reason that kind of is funny, but it's not, is because it isn't all that uncommon that truth that's not delivered the right way will make you mad. It will hurt your feelings. If you see a woman with a new dress on, it doesn't help her if you say that's a beautiful dress. Even if that's true, if you add this tagline to it, it's a shame it doesn't fit you well. Because even if both were true, they're not truth with wisdom. 
And if any of you husbands have ever done that, I'd love to talk to you a little bit and see if I can help you out. Truth. How do we live out God's truth so that we really are free? How do those two work in tandem? Because true freedom comes from a good understanding of truth. And there's just some very simple things I want to talk to you about this morning that I think are fundamentally underneath this subject of how do you become free because of the truth. I think the first is simply this, embracing the pure and complete foundational truth, or the truth of God. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You and I live in a culture that actually has become somewhat spiritual, somewhat religious. There are a lot of people who want to have spirituality in their life. They acknowledge that that's an important value to them. The challenge is that frequently the problem is that when you talk to them about, so what do you believe, they want to talk to you about my truth. This is what's true for me. This is what I've come to determine is the right answer. And the problem with that is that your truth can be based on the wrong information. Your truth can be based on things that are not actually livable, nor are they foundationally in character with who God is. And so when you embrace your truth separate from God's truth, it will frequently get you into trouble. Because the foundation for all truth, that is whole truth, is God. Jesus said to him, I'm the only way to God and the real truth and real life. It's important that you and I distinguish between some of these understandings that we refer to as truth. Have you ever told a half-truth? You didn't just outright lie, the dog stole my homework. You say, well, I worked on it for a little while. You don't define what a little while is. That means you opened the book. She didn't really study. So it was true. You opened the book. You maybe read a little bit, but you didn't really study. That's a half-truth. And we are full of a world loaded with half-truths. Then there's distorted truth. Truth where there's a spin that's been put on it. So that there is some truth in what's being said, but it's been given in perspective. The the problem that we have is we live in a world where we don't just have reality, we have our perception of reality. Now, let me just ask this question. How many, by a show of hands, think that it's a little too cool in this room this morning? Okay. How many think it's just a little too warm in this building this morning? How many of you think the temperature is exactly perfect? And the perfects have it. (laughs) By about a 60% majority. But the question I just ask you is relative truth. Because it's dependent. Some of you who said it's warm in here, I have a little secret for you. Take your jacket off. Some of you that are a little cold, ask your neighbor, can I borrow your jacket? You see, our perceptions of reality vary. And the truth is that there is a temperature right now that this room is, and yet the perception of that varies from how every one of us are wired and what we're wearing and what our personal metabolism functions with. 
all of that shifts what the actual reality is as we see it. And that's why truth can become very difficult, because it gets distorted. And then there's just false narrative of truth. Have you ever known somebody who just keeps telling the same thing over and over again? And they get pretty convincing. And frequently those people convince themselves before they convince anybody else. But the reality is, is that what they are looking at you with a straight face and saying it is true isn't true. And there is that whole sense of people who just lie. Have you ever known anybody who's just a compulsive liar? You're looking at them and saying, wouldn't it just be easier to tell the truth than the story you made up? And have you ever told a little bit of a story and then because of what it led to, you had to deepen the story? And so what started out as a little lie by the time you got through to become a rather large lie? happens in some form, shape, or fashion to all of us. And so what we have to know is this. If we are to get clear perspective of truth, if truth is indeed going to set us free, the very first thing we have to recognize is this. Our answer for truth is going to always come out of living out our relationship with Christ. Because God is truth. And our access to God is through Jesus, who is God. And He is inside of us, so that means if you're a believer, the truth of God is resident within you. It's that you have to be able to shut the noise of everything around you and really understand what is God actually saying to me. And some of that comes because our spirit, when we're saved, is reborn. And so our spirit begins to witness truth to us. And the foundation for which we can build that truth on becomes stronger and stronger the more we know and understand the Word of God because the Word of God is always true. And so the more we understand the Word of God, the more that we can have the consistent base of truth in our life no matter what. The one thing that's stable in our world is the truth of God. And here's the great thing. The ways that we do church, the things that we think matter can all shift, but the fundamental understanding of God's truth is always the same. When someone says to you, there are many ways to God... That's your first clue as a believer, they're off base. Because Jesus said, I am the way. We live in a world where so many different religions have gained traction. And and 30 or 40 years ago, when we talked about other religions, usually we were talking about in other nations, other parts of the world. And now you and I live in a nation that there is a rising number of other religions that are a part of our current culture. And so, because we want to be accepting, we want to be conciliatory to people, what do we do? We tend to try to embrace and say, well, maybe that works for them, and, and maybe they're getting to know God that way. Do you know the problem with thinking that? The problem is that it's not true. And so, if we perpetuate that, well, you know, if you're from this other religion, then maybe that's how you're finding God. What we're actually doing is we are helping them stay lost without Jesus. There is only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. Why am I hammering this so hard? You say, we know that. We've been hearing you say it a long time. We've been hearing it ever since we've been in church. Is because you cannot afford to ever forget that because that is the fundamental underlying reality of how we come to live in truth. Is because truth that will stand all tests, truth that will never be distorted, is God's truth. So it's important that we have a foundation in our lives that we know 
that Jesus is the way and that God is the source of both truth and He's the source of life. We are a very feel-good world. If it makes you feel good, do it. There's a problem with that. It makes me feel good to eat Cheetos for the first three bags. <laughs> Not that I've ever measured. There's a point where it overdoes. I remember as a kid going to my sister's house, and we were raised rather poor, so we didn't have a lot of fringe benefits. We just ate basic meals, and we didn't have a lot of junk food. We didn't have any junk food at our house. Now, I went to visit my married sister, and she made popcorn and buttered it. I had never had buttered popcorn. And man, it was incredible. And I think she had poured at least two pounds of butter on one batch of popcorn. It was dripping. It was so good, and it was probably about 9 or 9.30 at night watching TV. We didn't have a TV at home either. That was fun. And then I remember about 11 o'clock waking up, and my stomach was churning. And the popcorn came back around. And that's all I'll say. It was a long time before I want to butter popcorn again. And that's the problem with a world that's built on the philosophy, but it makes me feel good. We are so caught with things, with material possessions, with leisure. What are we going to do with our leisure time? You know, if, if this whole thing that I saw this week of a 32-hour work week passes a full-time job, we're going to have real problems because there's going to be way too many people with too much time on their hands. The truth is that we are in a culture that does not get it. And we have to come back to this. It's not that it's wrong to have nice things. It wasn't wrong to eat the popcorn. It was just probably how much I ate of it. It's the reality of understanding that underneath it all that we must live God's truth for our life. And when we begin to do that, what happens is this, and this is another reason why it's so important, is because of who God is. The completeness of God is that He's a God of truth that looks and can judge the difference between good and evil. And sometimes for us, it appears to be a thin line because what <clears throat> seems good, we then later find out is evil. Have you ever had somebody that you thought was a good person in your life and then you found out that they were cheating you, they were taking advantage of you, they were misusing you? And you were going, what's the matter? I, I thought this was good. And so the truth you thought you knew has now become a different truth. God is a God who knows all the hard things. He knows everything about evil. <clears throat> and He knows the difference between good and evil. And it's not gray to God. It's very clear. But in the same way that that kind of truth is a reality for who God is, the amazing grace of God is just as real. Because God understands what sin does to people. He understands how it impacts our lives and where it takes us down paths that sometimes we really didn't even mean to go down. And we end up in places we didn't intend to go to. And now what do we need? We need grace. You know, I, I don't want what I deserve. I want God's mercy and grace. And there's always this tension in the church world between truth and grace. And frequently there are churches that totally identify with the truth of God in the law of God. In the legalism of what is right and wrong. So much so that if you don't do everything according to what the law says, you're going to hell. And then there's this other side of it. Probably the worst song ever written was 
God's grace about the sloppy wet kiss. You ever remember that praise song? I don't even remember the name of it. And there's a lot of people who love that sloppy wet kiss of God in grace. And I'm telling you, that's not God's grace. That's our pathetic attempt to deal with where we don't have it together. And yet God's grace is amazing because it reaches to us in places where we have royally messed up. And yet the truth of what Jesus came to do is greater than what I did that messed up. Any place sin abounds, Paul says, grace abounds even more. So I have this truth that sin's a powerful force in the world, but I have this truth that counterbalances that truth that says, but God's grace is greater than anything that has ever missed the mark in my life. And so if I understand that, that kind of truth I need. Because I need truth that's going to keep me on track, and I need truth that is going to be there for me no matter what. That I know this, He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He's going to care for me. He's going to be there. He's going to be my God. And so it's so important that we have our life based in God's truth. Whatever it is that you have to deal with, make sure that you know what is God's truth in regard to any subject you're dealing with in your life. Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what some other family member thinks. Doesn't matter what political parties think. Doesn't matter what someone thinks that has social influence, that's a social influencer. If what they think or I think is not fully aligned with God's truth, it's no longer truth. And when I take whatever in my life and align it with God's truth, guess what's going to happen? The moment I identify God's truth, I'm on the path to working through whatever it is that has been wrong. The very starting point of your life becoming right with God is when you embrace God's truth for wherever you've missed the mark. However you've looked to see what God does. And then it's not just that is the foundation underneath, but it's also... And understanding another, what I think is a pretty simple truth, but it's pretty complex to live out. And that is engaging in the liberating reality checks of wisdom and health. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8. Don't think for a moment that you know it all, for wisdom comes when you adore Him with undivided devotion and avoid everything that's wrong. Then you will find the healing refreshment your body and spirit long for. I really believe that what this section is going to talk about is the secret for how to live life in God's truth. How do you do it? How, do, how does it work for what I'm talking about today when you get into whatever you're facing come Tuesday morning? The underlining components of God's truth are always wrapped in wisdom and health. Johnny McAllister and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, and I was telling him about a scenario that I was working in. And he said, you know, there's two words when I'm talking with someone that they struggle, that I try to always have them ask this question about what it is. And that is, in whatever it is that they're dealing with, or whatever needs to be dealt with, what you're planning to do, is it wise? And is it healthy? And I want to tell you, that's powerful truth. That as you navigate your life, if you'll remember this, that you need to always know what is the wise thing and what is the healthy thing. Whatever it is that you're facing, whatever decision you're needing to make. Whatever transaction you're engaged in, whatever relationship you're a part of, how do you navigate what is wise and what is healthy? And wisdom begins 
in adoration of God with complete devotion to Him. Proverbs 3 just said it. Wisdom comes when you adore Him with undivided of, uh, devotion and avoid everything that's wrong. God is never going to give you a bum answer. You're never going to talk to God and He's going to say, you know, later I thought about that and, and what I told you earlier wasn't what I meant. What I said over the Old Testament, I corrected in the New Testament. That's not true. The New Testament is actually a fulfillment of the Old Testament. It doesn't deviate from the truth in either section of the Bible. So when we look to God, if we begin to build our life first in adoration of Him, and we completely devote to Him, guess what's going to happen? You're going to have amazing wisdom. Because God's wisdom is not earthly bound. It, it, it's supernatural. It's eternal. It goes beyond all the parameters that we measure things with on earth. And so it is so important that you and I are always looking for how do I live in adoration of God. Wouldn't be a bad idea to this week only if you took five minutes that you began your day of just thinking about who God is and how you adore Him, how you love Him, how you want Him in your life, how you want everything that He is to be reality to you. Because when that begins to be the focus, here's what's going to happen. There's going to be amazing wisdom that begins to come to you because in His presence, His wisdom is going to be revealed. And then what begins to happen is we begin to know God and we can begin to live from the understanding of knowing who He is. That because we do know Him, it's not God as I see He is, it's God as who He says He is. And I begin to develop an appreciation for who I know God is. And I will tell you this, that's never going to happen if you don't spend time with Him. I think I know Grace pretty well. And unfortunately, Grace knows me pretty well. That didn't happen because we've lived in the same house and haven't spoken to each other for years. No, it's not uncommon at all for our days to begin with a good cup of coffee and just some time together. Because it's in those times that we get to know each other. And one of the things that's so important to me, I can trust grace with who I am. I don't have to worry that anything she finds out about me, that she's going to say, oh my goodness, how could you be so stupid? She finds, finds far more gracious ways to say that to me. She's never told me I'm stupid ever. Even though there's times I'd worry about her intelligence if she hadn't thought I was stupid with some of the things I've done. But you see, it's that relationship that's built between us. How are you cultivating God in your life? How do you spend place and time in His presence? Because that's going to begin to let who He is begin to emanate. And so then what will happen is you're able to begin to leverage the knowledge to the application of wisdom. Because everything that comes from God is wise. Everything God ever says has wisdom in it. And so when you begin to live from wisdom, guess what that means? That means you begin to live from wholeness. Bible says, be holy. 
And you know what we tend to do? We tend to get caught in legalism that defines holy as certain religious activities. But holiness is simply this. How do you live in the wholeness of who God is? How do you live in the wholeness of who He's caught, taught you to be? How do you live a life that is fully holistic spiritually with Him? And I'm not talking about holistic in some of the cultural buzz of that. I'm talking about holistic in a sense of truly being able to know that that is the best. Everything God ever does is done the best way. Everything God ever says is the best thing to say. It always comes out just right because God is whole. He's complete. And if you want to be complete, it won't come out of you doing a lot of self-help for yourself. It comes out of investigating the wholeness of God and then realizing this. He lives inside you. So that means if you're a believer, God's wholeness is in you. It's just having to work through the other junk that you've had that's built up in you before you knew Jesus when your mind and body were in control of everything without your spirit. And so you're having to retrain them <clears throat> so that you can now be sensitive to the wholeness of God but realize you can draw on that because that wholeness is in you. I want that to soak in for just a minute. The wholeness of God is in you. Now don't go home to your family this week and say, don't mess with me, I am the wholeness of God. That means you don't have it. <clears throat> but when we begin to understand that, then what begins to happen, we will also begin to be righteous. Because righteous, again, is not this religious understanding. Righteous means you do the right things. You make the right choices. That's what righteousness actually is. And righteousness is not something you pursue. Wholeness with God is the pursuit. And the righteousness will follow. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's not just a good verse to memorize. That's the powerful truth of it. Is the righteousness of God in Christ is in you living from the wholeness of God that is resident inside of you. And so when that happens, what's that going to do for you? That's going to help you make healthy decisions. And it's going to cause you to engage in healthy practices. So that now what begins to happen is because the wisdom of God begins to take hold of you, now you begin to choose the health of God. And there's health that's supernatural. If I'm sick, what do I do? I pray for God to heal my body. I pray for God to heal my mind. You and I live in a culture where various forms of mental illness are running rampant. You know what one of the saddest things is? Is that it's embarrassing to ever admit that. It's, some, it's one thing, it's okay to say I have a cold. But boy, you don't want anybody to know that you may have been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Do you understand that both of those come from the enemy? Sickness comes from the very pit of hell. And we need to be a f place as a church, as believers, that becomes a healing center for people who struggle in their minds and in their emotions. Because to God, that's just another part of the insidiousness of what sin has done. In the same way that we'd pray for cancer, we need to pray for God to heal our minds. I don't know that there is anybody who hasn't been damaged somewhere in childhood. I, I heard a story just a few days ago of a step-parent who has done horrendous things. And I thought, 
I don't know if I could deal with that if I was the parent knowing that was happening to my child and it was when my child wasn't with me and I couldn't stop it. Dear God, help us to understand that we are in a world with so much sickness. But when we begin to live in the wholeness of God ourselves, it begins to put other things right that are wrong. And it helps us know how to navigate a world where other people aren't doing what they ought to do. Where other people are choosing to live in ways that are unhealthy. It helps us with God's ability so that we don't become dysfunctional people. We learn how to functionally be compassionate and caring and yet operate out of the health of who God is. And the wholeness will cause us to be in healthy relationships. Do you have people that you're in relationship with that are just very dysfunctional? Have you asked God what you're supposed to do about it? You know what he's going to tell you sometimes? Get out of Dodge. Why are you staying there? You know it's unhealthy. You don't even need to ask me about it. Just get out of there. And there's other times that he's going to say, I've placed you there and here's what I want to do to empower you of how to deal with that. And this is how I want the relationship to go so you don't let the whims of somebody else's emotions choose it. You let the power of the wholeness of God in you define this is what the relationship is going to be like. And when we begin to live that way, the truth comes through and the truth helps us to live with wisdom and health. So it's so important to understand the key question for pursuing God's truth, whatever it is that's in front of you right now, if there's something this week that you're going to face that you need to do, ask those two questions. Is this wise and is it healthy? And if the answer is yes, then you can move forward. If the answer is no, then go back and ask this. So then, in light of that not being wise, what would be wise? And don't take a course of action until you know the answer to that. What would be healthy? And don't move forward into something unhealthy until you know this is the healthy way to move forward. And if you don't know how to figure it out yourself, look to people that you know that are godly in your life that you can trust and ask them to help you process what is it that needs to be processed in your life. Don't just do something that's not wise and unhealthy. Make sure you find what God's saying and with counsel of godly people, then you're in a place where you can move to the fullness of what it is that God has. Now here's the other element of understanding, knowing the truth and the truth making you're free. First of all, it's got to be based in God as truth. Secondly, it's understanding these concepts of wisdom and health as you make decisions. Because you're going to make them out of truth that will then set you free. The last area, and this is where life gets messy, is in our relationships. It's about formulating a lifestyle that practices relational kindness and forgiveness. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 30, The Holy Spirit of God has sealed you in Jesus Christ until you experience your full salvation. So never grieve the Spirit of God or take for granted His holy influence in your life. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults. But instead, be kind and affectionate toward one another. Has God graciously forgiven you? Then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. The Spirit-filled life inside of you as a believer will release the truth in you if you live from the Spirit. If you live after the flesh, you're going to manifest the flesh. But if you live after the Spirit, you're going to show the Spirit out of how you're living life when that's what you're following because that means you're living into the salvation process happening in your life. You know, I grew up a good Baptist boy. As a good Baptist boy, I grew up believing that if you had been in some evangelistic meeting where at the end of the service somebody said, 
if you don't know Jesus, would you raise your hand? And you raised your hand. Now I'm going to pray this prayer. And you're going to ask Jesus to come into your heart. And you pray the sinner's prayer. And boom, you got it done. You bought your ticket out of hell. Now, fundamentally, there's truth in that. The problem is it goes to this whole truth and the understanding of the wholeness of what salvation means. The truth is, when you prayed that prayer, you made the decision to open the door to salvation. Jesus came in when Zacchaeus invited him into his house. But it wasn't until Zacchaeus began to live from what had happened in inviting Jesus in that true salvation showed up. I really believe there's going to be a lot of ministers who are going to stand before God because we made it all about just that prayer and didn't talk that it's just an opening of the door. If you prayed that prayer, but your life never changed, I don't know whether you know Jesus or not. I'm not trying to put doubt in anybody. I'm just saying I can't guarantee that to you just because you went through the formula. Because it's never a formula with God. It's life itself. The truth is, I prayed that prayer when I was three years old on February 22nd. I remember it as clear today as the day that it happened. Kneeling with my mother at an old dining room chair after being at a child evangelism service. I can't tell you anything about that service except I walked away knowing I needed Jesus. And I told my mother, and my mother, being who she is, didn't say, well, when you get a little older, we'll talk about that. She said, well, Bill, let's just nail down right here and pray right now. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus came in my heart that day. I immediately became a legalistic Christian. You've heard me tell this. The next day, I was playing with a little boy in the neighborhood. And he picked up a cigarette butt out of the gutter, put it in his mouth, and I explained to him he was going to hell for smoking. I had immediately become a strong believer. <laughs> That's the problem. We don't understand that it's not rules. It's relationship. It's a decision. I follow Jesus. He's in me. The very life of this treasure is inside of me. And I am living every day pursuing salvation. So, so, Pastor, what do you believe? Do you believe in eternal security or do you believe that you have to be saved over and over again? Yes. I believe both are true and I think that's what the enemy has done. He's, he's gotten us to pick sides. I'm a once saved, always saved person. I'm an Arminian that believes that you sin, you've got to get saved again. And the truth is not in either of those extremes. The truth is in understanding Jesus is in my heart and I want to live it out to the fullness. So I am secure in who I am in Him, but I also, because I am in Him, I'm going to live like I am in Him. You know, if I had made vows to grace to marry her, and then when I was away from the house, I said, well, yeah, I really am married to grace, but, but this week... I, I'm going to date this other girl, but, but she's my wife because I took the wedding vows. There's something wrong with that besides Grace getting ready to send me to meet Jesus. <laughs> Hopefully I'd meet him. But the truth is, it's a process. You are saved. You are being saved. You shall be saved. Don't ever forget that. Live it to the fullest of who you are. Because when you live out that salvation, now you're on the right road for every other relationship in your life. And what happens is this. Broken relationship always leads to bondage and captivity. You were dead in trespasses and sin. And when you and I are living out of brokenness, guess what happens? Our relationships with others are broken, and we are in bondage. We're imprisoned by the things that hold us, that hurt us, that cause us to struggle with people because we haven't learned how to truly embrace who Jesus is in us and how to be set free. 
So the truth of God in you now begins to cause you to produce wise and healthy truth in all your relationships. So that if you're married as a believer and you have issues within your marriage, you have the power in you to have wisdom, how to have the kind of relationship that God wants you to have, and how for Him to work in you, and how to trust the other person to Him. It's not your job to fix them. It's your job to let Christ fix you. And it's your job to care for them. And trust that God is going to work what needs to be worked in their life. And when you live from that place, it changes everything. Same thing in relationship with your parents. If you are 45 years old and you still need your mommy to tell you how to do things, you need to get saved. You're an adult. God's your source. Honor your mother. Honor her wisdom, but live from the life of Christ, and now you're going to be able to have a healthy relationship with your mother, not an unhealthy one. Your boss, other employees at work, people in your neighborhood, wherever you go in life, all of our relationships come out of living in truth, and the truth will continue to set you free as you pursue it in all your relationships. And then what will happen is that will, that will take you and make you free from the control of negative emotional engagement. Have you ever known people that are just negative? No matter what, they always can find what's wrong. Well, it sure is a beautiful sunshiny day today. Yeah, you better not get out there. You'll get sunburned. They always find what's wrong. What do you do? How do you live in relationship with those people? Well, I would probably go outside and ask them to stay inside. That might be wisdom. Might be health. You see, God begins to show us how to navigate the specifics when we begin to let Him do that with us. And then the Spirit-filled truth releases this kindness in us that allows for us to graciously forgive. I won't take the time to go in this, but don't ever forget this. There's also a difference between forgiveness and trust. I forgive anyone who does wrong to me. Forgiveness is given. Trust is earned. It's again part of that healthy and wise. How do you make those choices in the relationship so that you go to the trouble to find out the difference between forgiveness and trust? So you can fully release in forgiveness, but you also don't allow yourself to be slammed again by the same door because you trusted where you shouldn't have. It's amazing. God does say, come let us reason together. God's ways make sense. It's how do we live and how can we find truth that sets us free so we can live, as Paul wrote at the end of that verse, from the depths of Christ's love. That we cannot just live a surface relationship, but we're living in the deepness of who God's in. You know, I think it's tragic because there's so many believers that have Christ in their heart, but they're still living in some form of prison that's been created in their life by what they've allowed sin to do. Still function. Same cage prison they were in before they embraced God's truth. I know why some people don't want what we have when we witness to them. Because if we're complaining all the time and if we're miserable all the time, why would I want Jesus in my life if that's what it's done for you? Are you still in the cage of what sin does? Or do you really understand knowing the truth and you've been set free. This is a true story. There was a bear named Ina who lived in a Romanian zoo where she spent two decades of her life confined to a cage not much larger than her body. What little agency she possessed, she exercised by walking the parameter of that cage each day. Ina didn't know any better or any worse. She only knew the cage. 
The closest she came to freedom most days was when her fur would brush against the bars or she poked her snout between the air between the cold iron. Her paws had memorized every inch of that patch of ground, drawing circles around it thousands of times each year. She knew this cage better than her own body. One day, Ina was released from her cage. And what did she do? She continued to walk in the outline in the dirt of where the bars had been, no matter how far away from that jail she was in. See, Ina? She's not in a cage, is she? What's she doing? She's still walking in it. Still walking in it. The truth is that she was released and put in a wonderful nature reserve in October of 2014. And that's where that picture is taken. And she has trees. There's a swimming pool that you can see is covered with snow at the moment. A nest. And yet, what's the problem? She still comprehends a life where she's behind bars and the cage is still around her. The cage is in her head, not around her. We look at Ina and that's sad. But I want to ask you today, what's the cage you were in when you met Jesus? As a believer, are you living in freedom from the cage? Or are you just still making circles in God's grace? But in your mind, you haven't been renewed. The bars are still there. You can take Ina down now. But I'm hoping that this is kind of implanted into your head. Because I just said we can take Ina down and here Ina still is. <laughs> kind of what some of us do, isn't it? Go ahead, we can take Ina down now. We were splitting the difference. Are you living life the way she is? All that God's provided. What part of God's truth are you not embracing? Do you believe half-truths? Are there things that are distorted truths, false truths? Or literally, are you buying into just plain lies? Because you're still circling the cage of Satan. Choose today to be free by embracing that pure and complete foundational truth of God. Engaging in those reality checks of is this wise and is it healthy. And formulating a lifestyle that practices healthy and wise relational kindness and forgiveness. Be set free by God's truth. Father, I pray for every person in this room today, and I pray for those that are online with us today. God, I believe there are people who are in torment right now. They know you, but they're, but they're caught in some form of deception or lies, and they're still like Ina in the cage. Oh God, may we see in the same way there were no bars where she's been taken to. There are no prison bars in the life of a believer. We've been set free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. God, let that go from rhetoric to truth. And let us live to the fullness of who you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you're in this room or maybe you're online with us today. And you haven't asked Jesus in your heart. And I do want to pray that prayer with you, not as it's all fixed now, but as the opening to a new life. And as we pray this prayer together, if you don't know Jesus, He's going to come in your heart, and you can start this whole process of what salvation does in your life, right where you are right now. So I'm going to ask everybody in the room to just pray with me. I'm going to pray it out loud. 
And if you don't know Jesus, you're praying it for the first time. Just pray it with meaning from your heart. And Jesus is going to come in. If you're online, Jesus is going to come in as you pray this prayer. You're going to experience what it is to know Jesus. Just simply say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. Give me eternal life. I receive you now. Amen.